All right, so this story starts with a middle-aged lady who actually walked up to the welcome desk one Tuesday morning a few months ago while most of us were sitting right here in conference. She actually looked pretty bad when she walked up there and was barely able to spit out her chief complaint, which was, I can't breathe. So the welcome desk folks, recognizing this lady was in a little bit of distress, decided to room her right away, and they actually brought her back into the Pease resuscitation bay because she looked that bad. And as they did that, they tried to get some more information from her, and what they figured out is she was 64. She had a history of cardiomyopathy, for which she gets annual screening cardiac MRIs. And she actually had that MRI earlier that morning, about half an hour prior to coming. Since that time, she'd just been a little bit dizzy and then progressively short of breath. So right away, we're thinking about the differential for acute onset shortness of breath. Not knowing much more about this lady at the time, differential's pretty broad. You know, is it some upper airway obstruction? Did she eat something she's not telling us about? Does she have an infection or inflammation that's obstructing? Does she have a history of asthma that was exacerbated by walking the halls of the hospital? Could she have a pneumothorax? Is she having an allergic reaction to something she was exposed to during the MRI? Could she have pulmonary edema from any of a number of causes? Hypertension, arrhythmia, PE, really all of this is on the differential. And she's looking worse and worse. So really not having much to work with, get her set up with some supplemental oxygen, get her put on the monitors, her vitals start coming up, everything's looking okay. It takes a minute or two to get a good oxygen waveform, and when we do, we see that her oxygen saturation is just 60% with supplemental oxygen. So now people are scrambling. Start listening to her lungs, see if we can get any clues to figure out what's going on. Her lungs actually, all we figure out is she has decreased breath sounds bilaterally. Not really helpful. So we decide, still don't know what's going on, let's treat her as if she's having anaphylaxis, see if it helps. So we give her Benadryl, Epi, Decadron. As we're waiting to see if that works, pull up her chart, see what else we can learn about her. Turns out she's actually pretty healthy. No coronary artery disease, no asthma. So right away the differential is getting narrower. And her imaging from that morning is actually up already. So we see her cardiac MRI shows normal cardiac function. And she had a totally normal chest x-ray just half an hour earlier. So something's changed. Try to figure out what we pull up, get another chest x-ray for her. This time it shows something like this, which is read out as new interstitial infiltrates suggesting interstitial edema. Not quite clear to do with that, what to do with that, but in the big picture, she's looking worse. Her blood pressure is now in the 80s systolic. Even with all the supplemental oxygen, her oxygen saturation is now at just 80%, and she's looking bad. So the decision is made to intubate her. So we get everything set up, get her intubated, kind of sit back, hope that that is going to cure her of whatever's going on. And as we're waiting for the oxygen saturation to kind of start climbing, what we see instead is frothy sputum starting to spill out around her ET tube, onto the bed, onto the floor. She's looking terrible. So repeat set of vitals at this time. She has a systolic blood pressure in the 50s now. And despite being intubated, despite the ET tube in good place, her oxygen saturation is now upper 60s, sometimes hitting 70, but really not getting anywhere better than that. So pretty clear at this point, we're not doing whatever she needs done. Um, she needs some level of care that we can't provide. So we're kind of getting ready to transfer up to the CCU for a presumed cath. Um, at the same time, going back to our differential, trying to figure out what are we missing, what else could we be doing. So going back to the differential, we now know she doesn't have an upper airway obstruction. She has a tube in place. We can cross that off our list. Um, we know she has no history of asthma, so it's probably not an asthma exacerbation. Um, no pneumothorax on chest x-ray. We haven't really ruled out anaphylaxis, but she sure didn't respond to our treatment. And pulmonary edema is looking more and more likely, although we haven't really narrowed down the cause. Still. We know we are not doing whatever she needs done, so we get ready, transfer up to the CCU, actually place an ECMO consult at the same time. Um, basically, kick her down the hallway as fast as we can, little trail of frothy sputum in her wake. Um, you know, our heart's beating pretty fast, fingers crossed. So she actually ends up getting put on ECMO, and I'll tell you what happens to her in a minute, but this is kind of um, an excuse to revisit ECMO and indications for that. So the more I read about ECMO, the more complicated it gets, but I think this diaphragm is, this diagram is about all you need to know, which is basically ECMO is a way to take deoxygenated blood from the systemic circulation, oxygenate it, and put it back in. Uh, it's been around for 50, 60 years, this technology, but we're starting to hear about it more and more because there have been a number of incremental improvements in the, in the technology, mostly in the circuitry and the machine itself, that have brought it to the point where when it was first introduced in humans in the 70s, there was 90% mortality to the point now that the clinical benefits are start, starting to outweigh the risks for an increasing number of indications. And we're actually seeing it being used more and more often in EDs across the country and initiated there, as you can see here. So the evidence for it, if you review that, it's pretty scattered and scant at the moment, but it's building. So some things that we have evidence for that we see commonly in the ED are, for example, an MI, 
30-day mortality with ECMO, some centers that do this, is as low as 39% versus 72% without. Um, and for other indications, the evidence is starting to build, and we're starting to see it used for all of these things across the country. So what do we need to know as ED physicians? Well, this is a start. Um, there are two types of ECMO. VV ECMO, or venous venous, is what you see here, where blood is taken from the venous circulation, oxygenated, put back into the veins, usually right at the level of the right atrium. And then the patient's heart pumps it out to the rest of the body. So this is for isolated respiratory failure. Then there's VA ECMO, which is pretty similar. Blood is again taken from the systemic circulation, reoxygenated, put back in this time in the arterial circulation, so bypassing the heart. This is for people who have both cardiac and respiratory failure. So which patients should you be thinking about using ECMO on? Well, we've kind of already answered that. Um, patients, as you'll see here, who have cardiac failure, respiratory failure, or both. And the list of conditions that fit into those categories is pretty broad. Things that we see in the ED all the time, things like MI, arrhythmia, PE, sepsis. The list goes on and on. One of the harder questions to answer, but equally important, is who should you not be thinking about ECMO in? Um, as Daniel said, you kind of need an exit strategy. If you think about it, what you're, in, you're doing is making an emergent decision to institute artificial life support in somebody, so you better be sure that they have a pretty good chance of coming off of that. So people that we know from the data don't have a good chance of coming off of it are people with terminal illnesses like a malignancy, old age, and people whose neurologic function might be compromised. So for example, somebody who got an hour of CPR prior to coming in. So I think it's worth revisiting you know, who should get it, who should not get it. So my pearls for that, who should get it? Reversible causes of cardiac or respiratory failure, who should not? Terminally ill, terminally old, and neurologic compromise. So if you can remember that, it's a start. So to go back to our lady, it's actually a success story for her. She was sent up to the cath lab, her coronaries were clean, she was placed on ECMO. Within a couple days, she was taken off ECMO. Her heart and her lungs were fine. Um, they really weren't able to definitively say what was wrong with her. They called it an idiopathic reaction to the gadolinium from the MRI, maybe. But she walked out of the hospital just fine a few days later. So I thought that was a, a good success story for ECMO and a good reminder that, you know, think about it even if you don't know exactly what's going on with the patient.